Hello from HIVR4P conference, which is taking place at Lima in Peru. And I'm really honored to have with me Jim Pickett, our old time friend, philosopher, and guide for me, at least. And uh, Jim is currently senior advisor at AVAC and also directs the choice agenda project of AVAC and does a lot many more things which I would like to hear from his mouth only. Thank you, Shoba. So nice to see you and uh, nice to talk to you and CNS and catch up. So yes, for, for AVAC, um, the choice agenda, just so people understand, it's a global discussion group or list about 2,600 members right now. Anyone's welcome to join. The, the topics are usually around HIV prevention research and implementation. And then we also program monthly webinars, sometimes more, on various topics that are related to HIV prevention research and implementation. Um, and another hat that I wear that's very local, I'm in Chicago, as you know. And in Chicago, I help lead a project for teenagers, so young people under the age of 18, it's called Prep for Teens, and it's an arts-activated community mobilization and social marketing campaign that's really designed to raise awareness of PrEP for young people, let them know it, it can be for them, they can choose PrEP, and if they're interested, point them in a direction where they can get teen-friendly, youth-friendly services that support PrEP. So those are the things I have currently ongoing. Uh, stuff I've done in the past, I was a rectal micro I, I still am a rectal microbicide advocate from long, long ago, still working on that. Um, and, a, and a precursor social marketing campaign I worked on uh, about PrEP was called PrEP for Love. And we launched that on Valentine's Day in 2016. And that was a campaign that really paired intimacy and pleasure um, with PrEP. And we took out sort of fear, took out stigma, and really tried to make PrEP sexy and position it as a way to have the kind of sex you want to have and not worry about HIV. It was very meaningful. I loved working on that. That ran in Chicago for several years. That actually influenced France, adopted that campaign, and then shot, shot it with their own models. Um, for their first, for France's first ever social marketing campaign. So it was like in the metros at, in Paris and stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, and that campaign actually inspired Prep for Teens because Prep for Love was very much an adult yes. campaign. And we were recognizing, you know, we haven't done anything for young people. In our country, you can get Prep down, you know, it's not even based on age, it's based on weight. So a 13-year-old can get Prep. Uh, and can consent for it, and um, but we don't have a lot of information or materials that are really designed for 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds. So we took it, you know, we did some research and now we're in implementation and it's fabulous, I love it. Okay, thank you, we'll come to that later because you say in your country it's available and uh, in many countries in life there's so many disparities. In India it's not even in the public health program as yeah, till now. Right. So um, uh, Jim, we last met on site in I think 2016 at, in Madrid. At, uh, 28, that was 2018. 2018, 2018 sorry, uh, yeah. 2018. And um, a lot of water must have flown down the river in these six years. So what, what has changed according to you? Pitfalls, successes? So, as we all know, so much happened between 2018 and now. We had COVID, yes. which kind of reshaped our entire world and was traumatizing. And also, it really changed some things for the better. We got, I think, globally, overall, I'm sure there's lots of exceptions, but we got better at telehealth and finding new ways to deliver health. We knew we couldn't do the same old model. Um, and we had to shake things up because we couldn't be in public. We, people didn't want to be around other people. We didn't want to continue COVID or spreading COVID. So we had to, and still deliver services. So how do you do that? So I think that there's been some good things that came out of COVID. We also learned that we could develop a vaccine and get it out there. Now, did we deliver the vaccine? Well, not really. Overall, we failed in many parts of the world, but we were able yes. to develop a vaccine yes. quickly, and that was a, a win. Um, in terms of the HIV prevention space, you know, since we, you and I last met, 
Um, we now have, you know, a couple years ago, um, cabotegravir was shown to work. So it's an injection that you get every two months that can prevent HIV. And while it, it's technically available, accessibility is very different. It's available in our country, but it's extremely expensive and it's very complex to procure from the clinic side. It's also complex to deliver. So our numbers are very low. So it's accessible, it's not accessible, it's available, but it's only really theoretically accessible. And as we're talking a lot about at this conference, we now know we have another injectable yes. Yes. that's on its way to being approved probably sometime next year mm -hmm. called Lenacapavir. This really could be a game changer. I keep hearing the word game changer here. Um, and it's two shots a year, subdermal in your tummy. Um, but it it's, remains to be seen what access will look like. Um, there's a lot of concerns about it. Uh, Gilead struck a deal, a licensing deal to, with, for generics for 120 countries, which is fantastic. But Gilead also left out of that deal Peru, where we are. Peru is the birthplace of PrEP. Um, and Peru was part of the study that, part of the study that Lena, Lena Capivir that showed it worked. They also left out Brazil, they left out Argentina and Mexico. Four countries who were part of the Lena Capivir studies and they're not in the access plans right now. So that's inexcusable, right? This is terrible. So we have this really great thing that's coming and people are calling it game changing and transformative and that will remain to be seen. There's no change in the game if you can't get on the field. And there's no transforming anything if that drug looks really good on paper and then it sits on a shelf and the people who really need it don't have access because this needs to be cheap, affordable, accessible to everyone anywhere in the world. We shouldn't be leaving any country out. Um, we definitely need to have uh, strategies for all kinds of countries. And my country, which is a high income country, we often get stuck paying the highest prices for drugs. Well, we always do. And, but that limits our avail ability to get it to the people who need it in our country. So we have terrible disparities. So it's exciting to see the science moving forward. And I'm, I'm really excited for these new choices that we will have, but they won't be real choices there's no, no choice if you can't access it. There's no choice if it's like there, but you can't yes. choose it, right? So we've had some exciting um, developments in science. And the last thing I'll say, and I'll turn it back over to you. Um, uh, you know, I, I mentioned I've been, you know, a rectal microbicide yes, advocate yes. for decades now. And I'm really excited that uh, the HPTN, the HIV Prevention Trials Network, um, it has launched a phase two study of a tenofovir based rectal douche. Yes, so a douche that provides hygiene before anal sex and then leaves drug behind that provides protection against HIV. I'm super excited about this. If it can pass through phase two and get into phase three, big hurdles, and then you know move to being regulated and approved and into the market, this would be our first ever what we call behaviorally congruent intervention, which means harnessing a behavior that people already do. People all over the world who have anal sex do some kind of cleansing before they have anal sex. All over the world, global north, global south, east, west, young, old, people douche or do something to get the hygiene they want. So it's natural to them. And if we can just add on to that and just add and make it a little more, even better, like you get the hygiene you want and the peace of mind with HIV prevention. Super excited about that. You are right, Jim, and science is doing its work. It's moving forward. But once the product is there, you came to that access issue and that is what is worrying us. And all the time then we say that we have to demand and the community has to come together and others. Is there some other way out that uh, there was a question, I was uh, attending that session where the douche was discussed and there was a question 
from uh, one of the audience that uh, how long will it uh, happen that the researchers are doing the work and then every time you have to fight for the access. And even about Lenka Pavir, like, uh, yes, thanks to Gilead, but thanks to so many people also along with Gilead. And uh, as you said, why 100, I am, I am also wondering why 120 countries only, why four countries left out of that. And also, we do not know what will actually be the price after that, what they call voluntary licensing. Right. So, again, we are totally dependent upon the private sector and the farmer sector. Is there some way out of this? Oh, Shobha, I wish, <laughs> I wish I had the answer to that and I wish it wasn't so hard. I mean, it's really frustrating to fight forever for these, this research to go forward and to find new ways um, to create new options for people and then to have success in the research space. And advocacy plays an important role in that. Yes. And community involvement from the very beginning is so important. And then to have something, and then it's, and now we have yet another, I think of it as we climb one Mount Everest, we get to the top, and then we're like, oh, access is, there's second Mount Everest. And that might even be a taller version of Mount Everest. and. So very frustrating. I think when we have for-profit uh, companies, pharma, when we have shareholders in the mix, we lo they lose sight of public health. I mean, pharma companies, their number one, um, their their number one uh, motivation, their what they focus on is their shareholders and creating profit and making money, and public health isn't about profit, it's not about money, it's about access and everyone, regardless of their means, being able to get what they need. So there's conflict and tension in that relationship. Uh, I think we can't let up. I mean, as frustrating and exhausting as it is, we have to yell, scream, fight, and we have to have an inside strategy and outside strategy. We need people, you know, at the proverbial gates, knocking them down with torches and pitchforks. We need people at the negotiating table who are saying, there's crazy people out there, we need to fix this. We really need to, and we can't let up, and we can't just say, throw up our hands and say, oh well, sorry, you know, if you can afford this, if you're lucky enough to be somewhere where it's affordable or it's covered by your government or covered by insurance, good for you, and the rest of you, sorry, we tried. Like, that's not acceptable. So. I think it's an all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. I think it's everyone who's involved from every community person, organizations, governments, policy makers, funders, pharma. We have to hold them accountable. And you know, we're bringing forward evidence. We know, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but Lena Capivir can be made for Forty rather inexpensively. $40, I think there was some uh, is, estimate. So I know it's very low. I yes, don't, yes, I'll I trust think. your number because right now I I'm not. I think it's around that. Yeah. But it doesn't need to be priced at $40,000 yes. to be um, mm -hmm. uh, profitable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, accept less profits. You're still going to be profitable. Mm -hmm. We're not asking pharma yes. to do this for free. Yes. We're, we know people need to be paid and innovations deserve their rewards. But do they deserve rewards that are just exponentially beyond profit and just exponentially so high that it can bankrupt health systems or make it so that health systems say, never mind, we just can't do this. And we have all these innovations, but we can't pay that kind of money. Um, we can't bankrupt our health system for one innovation when we have multiple health needs in any community. So I think it's not a great answer, it's not an easy answer, but I think we all need to um, use our voices, use our platforms, every chance we get, not take good enough, or and certainly not take no for an answer. We have to uh, you know, keep digging in our heels, fighting, yelling, negotiating, and keeping in mind the end game here. The end game is if we really want to end HIV, we really want to take HIV out of the equation of things that impact humanity, um, we, these interventions need to be cost, costed to move. And we know, and in the United States, in a high income country, even if something is, char if, you, if it costs a dollar or five dollars, 
that's a barrier. That dollar or five dollars could be someone's meal that day or their train ticket to get to work. And we, they have to be covered by the state, by the government. They have to be subsidized. And we can't subsidize things that are so grossly expensive. So that is, that is what causes a lot of discouragement that uh, if these things are, I do not know, if they can be ironed out to some extent, because uh, even for me, voluntarily licensing, again, we will be in the hands of the for-profit companies and right. um, how much they will decrease the price is... Right, in generic companies are great. They can, make, they can reduce the price, but generic companies are also... Yes, profit companies yes, yes. they're they're not you know they're not non-profits yes, yes. and so they have a price a motive uh to make money yes. so i think um you're right the licensing and that that's a very good first step but yes so i imagine india was on that list yes there are three that, companies there's a lot that, to do to make sure yes. that when it moves forward and it gets produced that it's priced in a way that the indian government can handle and that can give it to everyone in india who needs it or wants it. But I know you were saying like, you're having struggles with oral prep and oral prep was approved, uh, my God, 2012, yes. right? 2012 yeah. and we're now 20, 24, 12 years ago. Yes. Yes. And we're still struggling with that in many places in the world. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one. It's, it's like, it's not in the public health program at all in India. So. And, but treatment is free. See, the paradox is that, so in a way you are asking people to get the virus and then we will treat you for free for lifelong. Means what sort of economy is this? And talk about perverse incentives. Like yes. that's not, so right, if you have HIV, those drugs that we're using to prevent it also, yes. now you get them free, but now you have a disease the rest of your life yes. that's going to impact your life. Yes. Even with good medication, the disease is in your body and it wears things out over time. And um, we want to keep people HIV free. So we, that's a very perverse incentive. It also reminds me of, you know, in, in, in my country, in the United States, you know, there's many programs for HIV positive people around housing and food insecurity and transportation vouchers. We, we can provide a lot of things for people with HIV, and I'm happy for that. I'm a person with HIV, and I'm happy that we have programs that help people who need support. But um, people who are HIV negative, there's, uh, there's many similarities. They're the same kinds of people who are positive, and yet the negative people who are struggling in urban areas, don't have good housing, don't have a decent job, are struggling to find their next meal, um, no support, little support. And our message is, well, if you got HIV, I mean, it's not what we say, but it's the yes. overall message, right? Yeah, right? If you get HIV, you can get housing. Like, so I think there's more and more programs now that are saying, hey, we've heard housing is healthcare. Housing is also prevention. If we can get someone stably housed, make sure they have a full belly, make sure they're in a safe, stable place. That's HIV prevention all on its own, whether we give you a drug yes. or a condom or anything. And so I think we're having more recognition of that. But of course, these, lead, these are big structural issues. And, and the HIV community can't alone handle um, you know, our problems with people who are unhoused. The, the amount of people who don't have stable housing is way beyond the scope of the HIV field. And that is a truly all hands on deck that all of us as humans need to be working on. All of our, all of our fellow humans deserve to have a safe place to lay their head at night. And all of our fellow humans deserve to go to bed with a full belly and not hungry. And, um, and again, like our, what we're talking about here is just a narrow, so, so narrow. So I even go back to, as we have these interventions for people and we make them hard to get, we make them expensive or they have to jump through hoop after hoop after hoop. Well, these folks have lots of other things on their list. They have all kinds of other needs. There's not a person on the planet whose only need is HIV prevention. 
Guarantee you, there's not one. Mm-hmm. If there is, I want to meet them because they're a unicorn and they're, I would be fascinated to know someone who, whose only concern is HIV prevention. People who have HIV prevention as a concern have many other concerns. And um, many times for those, for those folks, these concerns are more pressing. Where am I going to sleep tonight? How am I going to get a job? Um, where am I going to find my meal? How am I going to get the education I need to go farther? Those are priorities. And HIV prevention goes down the list. So if we make HIV prevention really hard to get, we may have this fabulous thing, but it's hard to get, it's expensive, it's bureaucratic, it requires lots of visits, it requires you know, paperwork and, or money. People will be like, you know, HIV is th- theoretical for me. That's down the road. I have real needs today. I'm focusing on those. So we really need to be thinking about all of this as holistically as possible and seeing people as full beings that have all kinds of needs that need to be met. And the more we can meet those needs, those support HIV prevention. Again, if you know where you're going to sleep tonight, you have less HIV vulnerability than if you are, I'm not sure. I'm going to find out. I might I have to figure something out. We'll see what happens. That makes you more vulnerable. And if we can reduce that through structural interventions and society-wide interventions, Again, it requires a lot of commitment, political commitment, money, energy. But I think the more we can see these things as big package together and not sort of separate niche things, because you as a person, you're not separated. You're one whole person. I'm one whole person. And we have to be thinking about, I think, our communities that way as well. Yes. So that social inequity, unless it goes, and I think... That is where we have to put our minds in. Uh, Jim, I was surprised even during COVID time, say. And then we start blaming the person and the people right. that th- it is they who are responsible. So there was, the, there was that simple thing that wash your hands as often as you can during COVID to prevent in, uh, infection from spreading. Now, there were so many, at least in my country and I'm sure in other countries as well, people did not have enough water to drink they did not have enough portable water in their house. Where would they get the water to wash their hands every time? Yeah. You, that's a perfect example. Yes. It's a perfect example. And then what you mentioned before really resonates with me. And it makes me really sad because our instinct right away is to like blame the individual. Yes. Yes. It's the individual's problem. It's yes. you need to do something. When there's these huge structures that are not their responsibility. Their lack of access to enough clean water is not their fault. It's the fault of a system and a structure that has been designed in a way that doesn't share water equitably. And so, but yet we now make it, it's on you to figure that out. And it's very diabolical because it isn't about individuals. So much of this stuff is about structures and i'll go you know an example in the united states we have a a healthcare program called medicaid which is for people who are um who are you know have who don't make a lot of money right Uh, and so we have some states that have expanded medicaid and brought more people onto their roles made it easier to get this kind of broad health insurance and we've had a number of states who have not expanded medicaid well, if we look at where HIV is happening and where we have less, we have worse outcomes in terms of care and prevention, you can guess where I'm going. Where we have expanded Medicaid, we're doing better. Where we have not expanded Medicaid and made it much harder for people who are not making much money to get the health care they need, guess what? They're getting HIV more. They're not, they're not having access to treatment. They're not able to get to undetectable and stay there because these structures and systems have failed them. It's not a failure of them as people, but it's unfortunate. And especially in the US, which is so individual centric, we love to blame things on individuals and people and communities as opposed to the huge structures of which they do not have control. And it is not their fault. Like it's again, like, is it your fault that you don't have access to enough water every day? Is did you do something that led to that? 
No, some, somewhere, some much bigger force has created that situation. And I think the more we're conscious of that, we can untangle it and dismantle it and tear it down and rebuild things that say, you know what, no matter who you are, no matter how much money you have, no matter how much money you don't have, you deserve access to clean water. You deserve a roof over your head. You de deserve some basics for humanity. Um, and I think we have to keep sort of that drumbeat up as much as we can. Uh, this is a little political question, but so you may, if you don't want to answer, you may not. But do you think with the, like I'm very worried with the rise in right-wing governments coming in many countries. Is that impacting or going to impact our services? Oh yeah, and so I'll just make a statement just to keep, yes, you know, yes, I work yes. for five, I work for nonprofit organizations. Right. So I'm representing myself yes. now, Jim Pickett, as a person, as a voter in the United States. I'm not representing an agency and organization. Um, and I'm a consultant, so I do just work for myself. And I, my job with AVAC is consulting. My job on Prep for Teens is consulting. So saying all of that, I'm very worried. And we have seen the rise of right wing all over the world. Yes. And we've seen it in the United States. We are so close to electing an authoritarian tyrant who um, is evil. I mean, I would not, it feels crazy, histrionic to say that, but uh, Donald Trump is a really bad person. And it's not just him. He is, an entire party now has been turned towards him as this sort of leader, almost godlike. And it, there's a lot of hate feeling it. There's a lot of racism feeling it. There's misogyny feeling it. Um, there's this idea that democracies don't work. We've seen that in India, yes, right? Yes, democracy is a very important. You know, oh, India is a big democracy. Yeah, very big. But but see what is happening. But you see, right? You know, like democracies don't work. We can't let people make their own um, decisions. Only a select few should make decisions for the rest of us. Well, we're seeing that in our country. And it's really scary. And I think we have to push back. And I'm hoping we're able to push back in the United States and elect um, Kamala Harris and Tim Walls, um, who are not authoritarians. Will they be perfect? Will I agree with everything they do? 100% no. Um, but I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for people who are reasonable, who believe in the rule of law, who believe in facts and science who believe yes. in that there are facts, that there is yeah. truth. I mean, the, one of the huge problems I have with Donald Trump is he lies, lies, lies. They all lie. They lie all the time to the point you no one can determine anymore what's truth or not. And it's dangerous. So I know like the other selection, Walls and Harris, they are decent people uh, and they're not going to spray us with a fire hose of lies. So I'm deeply concerned. I have some optimism that we're going to be able to do the right thing in the United States. Um, but, you know, if it's, and I worry for the world because the United States, the role the United States plays in the world, yes. what happens in our country will have impacts Back everywhere. Um, we, we fund research, we fund stuff, good stuff. We also fund a lot of terrible stuff, but we do good in the world and if our policies and our priorities can can hurt a lot of people or they can help a lot yes. of people. And so I'm going to keep optimistic and help get out the vote, vote on Election Day, and hope we can turn the corner on this terrible chapter we've been in and elect people who um, believe in the rule of law, believe in the const our Constitution at least, um, and believe that communities, we all have a right we have a right to be part of the decision. We have a vote. We have a say. We live here in whatever country we are. We have, we have a say in what happens. And we can argue about how that's going to look. But my voice matters. It's not just the voice of one authoritarian. So uh, I'm glad you brought it up because I think that, and that's on a lot of our minds here. Yes. I mean, I think that's a 
definitely a subtext here. I've had many political conversations since I got here a few days ago. <laughs> Because there are so many countries in Europe also who are yes. getting into this right wing thing and that is like it's pushing us back, I do not know how many years or a century back in... Centuries. In, yes. What yeah, I mean, what's happened with abortion access in our country? I mean, yes. we took away the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision mm -hmm. with that being struck down. Now it means it's up to the states. So yes. about half, half our states have abortion restrictions. Mm -hmm. And half our so basically treating women like they're chattel, yes, like they're yes, cattle, yes, like yes. they're vessels yes. that have no control over their lives, and that's really scary. And um, uh, it's you know we we have to push back because that is taking us mm -hmm. so far back. Uh, women, uh, all of us need to have bodily autonomy. Like that's. That's just so so basic and central. Like you should make decisions about your body. I make about mine. If I don't want to, if I don't like abortion, I don't have to have one. Right. Right. And and it's not my business whether you do that or not. Um, you have a right to your own health care decisions and to not have the state and not have elected officials deciding. So right now in our country, depending on where you live, depends on what kind of health care, again, what you, what you can get. So I'm lucky that I live in, my state is Illinois. Mm -hmm. We're like a haven. Um, we, we've protected abortion access. Yes. We have protected like trans folks and yes. protected health care for queer people and women, et cetera. But all the states around, many of the states around us know um, there's huge swaths of the country where there are no protections anymore. And if you don't have means, you can't leave the state. You can't just go somewhere else to get it. So it's very concerning, and I, I will be very glad when election day is over and we can have a new president, and um, and we can you know turn turn the tide on this. And and I think the last thing I'll say on yes. the on the political side, you know, we've we're a two party system in our country, yes. Democrats and Republicans. Um, we need a two parties. We need the Republican Party to come back. And we need those, we need that tension. We need to have that discussion. There are different ways to do things. And it's not just about the Democrats. But right now, the Republican Party, I mean, they're climate deniers, they're denying science, they're denying like the sun sets in the West, basically. And you can't that's not a place you can negotiate from. We have to agree on facts. Exactly. And then we have different ways. We may have different priorities, and that's what a democracy does. You fight over those priorities, and you move, as, and you try to find consensus, and you find the best solution listening to everybody. We need to get back to that, and our country really needs two parties that can do that. And not just your country, Jim. I think so many countries in the world need that because we are moving, science is moving maybe 10 steps ahead and we are moving 100 steps back. Yes, I 100% agree. I 100% yes. agree. So uh, let us uh, close the discussion on a positive note. Oh, and thank so, you. Thank you. So, so you want me to come up with something positive? Yes. yes. <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the, the Prep for Teens project yes. I'm working on. Yes, so yes. Um, I, it's, it's really, and we've heard a lot of, bit of this at the conference, yes. um, putting youth in charge, mm -hmm. having youth lead us, mm -hmm. supporting them from behind, but letting them step forward and take the reins and us getting out of the way. And so the project I'm working on, I feel like we've done that. Um, we have really centered teens. We listen to teens in focus groups and through research on what they wanted in a prep social marketing campaign. We then, teens came up with the plans for our campaign in Chicago, and they're really helping us lead the implementation of it. So teen, it's teen ideas and teen guidance all the way through, and it's the most, it's giving me the most joy because they understand their community. And if we just get out of the way and let them do what they need to do. Now, I think there's a space for people like you and me who are seasoned, we've been around a minute. Um, we don't have to, we don't disappear, but we can use our, our experience, our background, our, our, our connections, um, our knowledge, our privilege 
to support these young people and helping them get the future they want. So the campaign I work on, we do all kinds of different arts activations, whether it's dance or music or visual art. That's all created by them. They create the materials, they create the, uh, the messages. And it's so empowering for them to do that. They're paid to do it. Mm -hmm. And my job is to really just facilitate, mm -hmm. to help. Like, what do we need to get this done? Okay, you want to do this? All right, let's figure it out. We need money for this? All right, we'll find a grant. That's what I can do. But the ideas and the movement forward is them. And um, that's how the team works. And I'm, it's, it's the right thing to do. Uh, and it's uh, incredibly meaningful. And, you know, coming back to the conference, there was a whole youth-focused um, satellite that the Mosaic Consortium did, God, was it on, it was on Sunday. And um, the whole panel were these young women, you know, in their, I don't, maybe early 20s, very young. And oh my goodness, so smart, so polished, so poised, so thoughtful, so, with so many ideas. And we need to, it's their time to be leaders. Someone said in this session, these are not the leaders of tomorrow. These are the leaders of today. So let's stop talking about youth as our leaders of tomorrow. Let's look to youth as our leaders of today. And folks like us who are seasoned, we know when to step aside. We know when to step in the background. We know when to share space. We know when to exit the space and stay supportive from behind. We have a role to play, but it may not be front and center anymore. And I think for a lot of us, it's hard to give up being at the front and the center. It's like, what do I do if I'm not at the podium? There's a lot of things you can yes. do if you're not at the podium. Someone else, it's someone else's time. Mm -hmm. You support them from behind. And I'll tell you, I've been on the front of the podium and where I am now with this campaign, this is some of the most meaningful, joyful work I've done in my life. Mm -hmm. Like seeing these things just kind of grow, Blossom. you see the light in the eyes, you see these beautiful, the magic happen, it's absolutely remarkable. And I don't need to be at the very center of it uh, to feel amazing. I mean, it's some of the most beautiful things I've been connected to ever. So um, I, I will leave it on that, I think. Yes. Youth will lead us. And let's look to young leaders, because I think we talked about all these intractable problems. Mm -hmm. And all this, we got us into these problems. People our age and older, hundred, you know, generations of people have got us here. And we have to change the script on this. And I think there's a lot of really smart, motivated, committed youth. If we support them to really shine, they can help us fix some of these problems move us forward instead of going back, like you said, mm -hmm. decades, if not centuries. Mm -hmm. So I'm really, really, that session gave me such hope and joy for what can be had in the future. Seeing the, and it was all, the youth were all young African women. Mm -hmm. And to a person, they were so impressive and so astounding. I couldn't imagine being that poised and confident when I was 20 in a stage in another country in front of hundreds of people. And wow, like they can really take us there. So I think that's going to be how I leave us on this conversation. That's what I'm hoping for. Yes, but I hope this goes on to other countries and not yes. just remains confined there. There's right, I think we can all, let's all learn. Africa yeah. needs to help, yes. can teach us these things because yeah. we want to do this in India. Yes. We need to do this in the United yes. States. Yeah. We need to do this everywhere. We need to be refocusing and looking towards not just saying youth you will have your time mm -hmm. we always like to push it off mm -hmm. you have to do this or that first your time will come no your time is now do they still need us yes they need us to support that 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 path but we really need to get out of the way and i think if we did more of the getting out of the way we would see radical change and i'll go back to politics in a positive way yes. i think our country, my country, is more than ready for a woman leader. I want, I think women, I'm a fan of women. And I think having a woman in charge is something we need. 
And I think that that perspective, the what women, their lives and what women go through, they bring a very different uh, lens and experience to the work. And I think it's time to like give folks who haven't been in the spotlight or who haven't had leadership, youth, women, other minority, like gender minority, sexual minority, whatever the case may be, let's give them their shot. And I think that could also undo, help be some of the undoing that we need to do. Thank you so much, Jim. And you just, uh, maybe you are just echoing my thoughts because I strongly believe in what is called a feminist world order, which we need, which... <laughs> I want a matriarchy. I want. I mean, I, and I'm a feminist, and feminism yes. is like everything that feminism stands for. I believe in, and we yes. need someone yes. to embody that yes. and to help us move forward. And I think there's plenty of men who are uh, feminists yes. who understand, right. who can handle strong women, who who respect women, who know women bring a, a very important perspective and viewpoint. Of course, we can say not all women and not all women leaders in our yeah, history yeah. have been good in other countries. But oh my goodness, I think it's time to have some diversity, yes. equity and inclusion at yes. all different levels of our government, of institutions, researchers. Last thing I promise we'll say about this conference, I've, you may have noticed already, but so many of the panels we are seeing yes. here, it's not just a bunch yes. of old white guys. Yes. Yes. How many conferences have we gone to, Shoba, where it's oh, yes, mostly most white guys yes. and maybe one woman, yes. Yes. or mostly people from the United, you know, from the North, yes. and very few people with yes. brown or black skin? Yes. Here, it is the opposite. Yes. Yes. So far, most of the panels have been young people of color, people from all over the world, different countries. It has not been dominated yes. by white men from Europe yes. or the United States. And you know what? It's been a great conference so far. Yes. So let's, that, more of that, more of that, please. Thank you, thank you very much <laughs> for rooting for a feminist world order, which yes. is, according to me, solidarity yes. and care for everyone. Yes, thank for you. sure, thank for you. Sure.